Welcome to the Signpost End Podcast, everyone. It's good to have you here. My name is Brandon Booth. I'm your host, and I have with me today my regular co-host, Peter Gamble. Good to see you, Peter. Hey, Brandon. Good to be here, as always. Yeah, it's good to have you on the back porch. Listeners, we have uh, a lot of stuff going on in the Signpost End world. As you know, if you're a regular listener, we call this the back porch because our podcast episodes are meant to be friendly conversations among friends. We're not experts. We're not trying to change the world. We're just trying to have an, enjoy a good conversation. We had a tragedy strike the podcast. And that tragedy is we recently had our staff retreat at our lodge where we do retreats and such in Westcliff, Colorado, in the beautiful mountains where there's a giant wraparound porch. And we recorded an entire episode of this podcast with Matt, Peter, and myself all on the back porch together for the first it was awesome. time. I know for the first time ever, we were physically located on a back porch together with this gorgeous mountain scene behind us as a storm rolled in. Like it was incredible. And there was no audio. <laughs> we had, we had the, this beautiful silent video of a wonderful conversation. So we are, and it was probably our, only chance to do that it's really ironic too because our topic of conversation was returning to silence child yeah. a childlike faith and so it's nearly ironic and fitting but still Gosh. devastating yes yeah. yes so we may hope we may post some pictures of the three of us together enjoying a beer on an actual back porch having an actual back porch conversation but unfortunately there's just no audio and the next chance we get to do it might be two years from now I hope you enjoyed today's show. It's also going to be fantastic. We have this brilliant idea. Peter's been working on a topic and thinking about attention, fixing our attention, dot, 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 question mark. Maybe that's a pun. And we're going to talk about that today. But before we do that, I want to tell you just, a, first of all, our staff retreat went fantastic. We had our board. We have some great big plans for 2025 and beyond. God has asked Signpost End to start thinking. Not what can we do with our resources, but what does he want us to do with his infinite resources? And so he really called us to think big. I am super jazzed about it. This is all I'm going to say here, which is if you know a donor of significant means who resonates with a ministry that is doing things differently, that wants to help people lift their gaze from this chaotic world and sustain it on Jesus. If you know somebody who is looking to invest in a ministry that makes big changes in the way people feel about God, the way they think about God, and reimagine the way he relates to them, then I, I need to know this person, and I want to talk to them. I will personally fly out and meet with you and anybody you know that is looking to make a change in this world that's different than what other people are doing. We're not a program. We're actually meeting people on their spiritual journey where they are and fixing one of the crucial issues that they struggle with, which is how they feel about God and how they think about how he thinks about them and feels about them. So that's kind of the big ask. There's going to be a letter and some other stuff coming out soon. But if you know somebody, we are ready to make some big steps. We could use your help. Introduce us to somebody you know that would really resonate with our vision. That's the request. The other fun stuff to talk about is, if you haven't seen it yet, Leaves and my new book, Not Home Yet, uh, How to Be Human in an Inhuman World, is absolutely for sale on the store, signpostend.org slash store. Go pick it up. People are loving it. I'm getting a ton of great reviews and comments. People are texting me saying, I loved this line. And you, I think you're really going to love the book. You need, If you like anything that we're saying, you need to go pick up the book. It's cheapest on our website, signpostend.org slash store. Don't forget, you could also pick up a free, entirely free PDF download at the same time. Just add that to your cart, please. Go, go check it out. I want to get this book in people's hands. It's actually going to change the way you think and feel specifically about how God feels about you. All right. All those are just my little ads and updates. Um, how about actual updates from us, Peter? What What's going on in your life? Yeah, um, let's see. Yesterday or something. I can't. 
I don't know when my son turns four months. If he was born on the 31st, does he turn four months on the 30th of a month or the first of the month? I think it's the oh. 30th, right? Because yeah, it's the end of the month, you, yeah. right? Do that. Because it's not, yeah. yeah. Right. So he, he's four months old now, which feels surreal. And it's wonderful and challenging and hard. Sometimes I sleep well and sometimes I don't. I'm just, you know, still on that roller coaster ride. And uh, yeah, we recently, uh, Rachel and I have had the opportunity to have some friends here in town, which was a real joy to see our friends from back in Maryland. And then my folks are coming out tomorrow. They're going to be here tomorrow afternoon for about a week. And uh, we're, oh, that's awesome. we're excited to, to see them. And so, yeah, kind of some milestones for Ben and getting to share that with friends and family is, is some of the main things we're at where we're at right now and join it milestone that i thoroughly appreciated was sunday morning that you sitting right behind us and ben leaning forward and chewing on the pew that was like <laughs> oh my gosh man i have so many memories of my children chewing on pews <laughs> it is great i was like this was this was such a great milestone yeah he didn't yeah he doesn't have any teeth yet though so it didn't leave the teeth marks that no ah i was we're wondering if he's thinking about starting teething soon because he's doing a lot more of that stuff recently which we know it's, will be in for a fun time once he really yep it's when you leave the teeth marks on the pew that you know you have arrived as a family i mean that's just yeah. oh and plus good. nobody for... wants to sit there if it has your child's teeth marks so you doubly reserve your pew <laughs> that's the real important part <laughs> Because heaven forbid anyway. we have to sit in unfamiliar seats. Oh my gosh, I can tell I'm going to get you started on something if I go down that track. Okay, we're not going. We're not. Um, quick, quick, shift our attention. Shift, Brandon. Shift, topic. shift our attention. We got to fix this problem. Yes, exactly. Um, I do want to get to our topic quickly. I think it's fascinating to me, the idea of what's wrong with our attention. Um my my brief update from the back porch personally is um i've realized this is the segue um all this talk about the internet shortening our attention span and uh phones and everything else causing us trouble like i admit i took facebook off my phone again recently i took lots of things off my phone that have been messing with my attention and i changed my homepage my main screen, you know, when you go on your phone and put specifically like my prayer, my reading, my long attention span apps front and center in a little shape of a, like a little shape that lets like what's priorities. And I found already that's kind of helpful because it's just like, it's harder for me to get to the stuff that's easy to distract me. And it's reminding me, this is the stuff that I value and want to be doing. And that's been good. On the other hand, I've also noticed, and maybe this is just me, but sometimes I feel like I have the opposite problem with the internet. It's not that I get super distracted. It's that I get super focused on, like hyper focused on one topic and go down a rabbit hole and not a bad rabbit hole. I don't mean that. I just mean like I've been reading a book online about good judgment and, uh, and understanding people and being able to evaluate their characters, which is fascinating to me. I can get lost on that for two or three hours at a time and not realize that I've just spent three hours on this like side interesting project when I should have been doing something that I actually had on my to-do list. So I don't understand what that is. I don't know if that's in a symptom or I'm strange, but like it's not the problem of me being distracted by many things. It's the problem of me being distracted by one particular thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, if anybody's interested, the book is fascinating. It's called Good Judgment by uh, Richard Davis. And it's really about hiring people, which is not what I'm, I mean, I may be interested in that soon, but it's about using the Big Five Personality Test or Big Five Personality Framework to better understand people and make good decisions about them. I find it more broadly applicable. I mean, he's telling you how to interview somebody, whether to hire them or not. 
but I find it really applicable for understanding how people function and what their personalities are like. It's called Good Judgment, Making Better Business Decisions with the Science of Human Personality by Richard Davis. Hmm. We'll have to throw that in the show notes or something. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the topic for today. Let's focus our attention on the topic of attention. The title of the show is Fixing Our Attention. So Peter, this has been your idea. You've been talking about this for a while. What's wrong with our attention, Peter? Mm. And how does, why, what needs fixing? Yeah, that is the question, right? Um, so uh, I have a couple of points that I want to eventually get to, but hey, I want to start sort of where this started for me, which, uh, and this is probably long ago, but I think I became aware of how dissatisfied I was with how I was spending my attention about two years ago when I started using this little notebook. This was the uh, first pocket uh, little notebook that I carried. It was like just from Office Depot here in town before it went out of business. So this is like 50 cents or something. Pages are falling out and stuff, but uh, it's a crappy little notebook that um, I started carrying around in my pocket. And in the first page, this is what I say. I am endeavoring to use this little book to draw my attention to things that matter. Um, hopefully I can hmm. flush out thoughts and ideas without external distraction. And then I have a side note of a telescope or perhaps a microscope to focus on one thing at a time. Um, huh. But what you, were, what you were just saying, Brandon, about getting caught up on something on the internet, and maybe it's not 10 different things, it's one thing. I also relate with that. But I was just finding that the internet has so many fascinating things. For me, it's YouTube, right? I can just browse and be like, of course I want to learn how to braid my own sling. Because what the inner boy in me is like, of course I want to have a sling and, <laughs> and learn how to accurately throw rocks at stuff. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I get into these random topics that are fascinating and many of them aren't bad or anything. I just find that if I had sat down and said, what are my priorities? What do I want to be about? What are the things I want to enjoy? 10 of the things that I'd recently watched on YouTube would not make the list, right? So yeah. I was getting interested in so many things and yet I didn't, it, I don't know. I, I never did anything with any of them. I just sort mm -hmm. of had this broad interest of like, oh, that's kind of cool. Which side note, I think God made us that way, right? To learn about the world and explore. I think there's a healthy curiosity of like, that is cool. I do want to learn about that. But for me, that's sort of where this started of, of realizing that in a way, my attention was getting hijacked. Mm -hmm. That I wasn't fully in the driver's seat. I wasn't saying, you know what I would like to spend my leisure time or my free time doing? I want to do this or this topic or this interest. I was sort of just casting my attention out like a fishing, you know, fishing in the wide world of the internet, specifically YouTube and saying, someone give me something really interesting right now. And, it, yep. you know, a thousand videos were, you know, trying to chomp at that bait and, and take my attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so I found that to be a problem because I was, although I was curious, I didn't have any real a direction behind it. Nothing came of it. And I was dissatisfied mm -hmm. with that. And, and so I think maybe many of my friends and family and the people I talk to resonate with this sort of, I mean, I'm not fully in control of my attention, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I get sidetracked and I get distracted by many things and I wish that I had a better ability to focus or attention span or whatever vocabulary is, is accurate mm -hmm. there. And thinking about some of the reasons why this happens. And, and one, one is that um, the world is crazy, right? We live in a chaotic world. Outside of just, you know, on the internet, algorithms literally designing things to try and get your attention, engineering things specifically for you to hook you into yeah. watching longer, to watching all these things, right? To, to leave aside marketing and all that. The world is engineering itself to say, your attention is what I want to grab, right? Yes. I think the image of like being in like a, a carnival, you know, as a kid and, and every guy at the booth is loudly proclaiming their wares and you're like, oh, oh, wow, that looks amazing. Oh, that, that too. And, and, yeah. 
and that's like that is a picture of the world we live in and how mm -hmm. everyone everything is urgently demanding our attention in many ways mm -hmm. um can i pause you there on that image yeah, yeah. because that image is so perfect partly because of first of all carnival you know i mean there's a lot of rich tradition to that idea or, or rich history to that idea of the world being a carnival hmm. that that in a sense this is not a new thing that we are humans are facing in our day and age, but the world has always been a fragmented, loud and boisterous crowd of people demanding our attention for crap, <laughs> for, for evil, for useless, for trinkets. For I mean, just this is, you know, and, and in a sense, we all, I just resonate so deeply with the that image being a little boy going to the the street fair and everybody hollering and all the cool things and the the frozenness i felt you know i had five bucks in my pocket and i could spit it on the little trinket what trinket was i gonna buy and i could not decide because everything was constantly grabbing my attention and of course inevitably i bought something trashy and it wasn't even worth it enough for right. so sad that i bought it 30 seconds after i bought it right yeah yeah and like that is just exactly the way the world works. Here I am sitting in my garage watching because I have a little setup in my garage watching YouTube like you were talking about. And I've spent 30 minutes watching a YouTube video that I don't even remember today what it was yesterday right. because it's completely pointless. Same exact picture. Mm. And, and the feeling you just described of that, like that overwhelming like paralysis of like there's so much going on. The world is crazy, right? And outside of just it being chaotic and noisy, there's like actual evil and tragedy that like weighs on our soul. Like that's a huge piece of this too, where I think the second reason our attention is the battleground it is, you know, is because we're looking for ways to cope with this crazy world. I'm not only mm -hmm. having people steal my attention, but I am also in, in mostly a subconscious way saying, ah, this world is nuts. I don't want to attend to this. I don't want to look at all the bad stuff going on in my life or in the world. Mm. Somebody entertain me. Somebody take take my attention away from all this stuff that's going wrong. And even if it's just briefly, you know, entertain me or get my mind off on something else. Yeah, we surrender our attention to things as a way of escaping, sort of temporarily escaping pain. Boy, that's a toxic cycle, right? Because mm. it's not just the pretty distracting things in the world that try to steal our attention. I mean, I'm, it's, it's all the tragedies. It's all the really bad stuff that's actually there that in some sense, each one could completely absorb us. You know, like giving our full attention to you know, we're we're recording this right now just as the Hurricane Helene has ripped through the South. Mm -hmm. Like that demands the full attention of all of the people in that area to hell. And that one issue in the world could completely consume our attention. And for some of us, it should. Like we'll get to that. But but then there's also the stuff going on in the Middle East. There's the stuff going on in Russia. There's the stuff going. I mean, there's everywhere you turn, there's something. And then in my own life, family issues, personal issues, each one of these things could consume my attention entirely. And I'm exhausted. Where do I even turn? Which one do I attend to first? And how would I even know? Which maybe I don't need to attend to some of them, but that feels wrong. Like, am I not supposed to pay attention to the tragedies in the mm -hmm. world? Like, mm -hmm. doesn't that feel like a, you know, so yeah, it's... <laughs> Ooh, give me some YouTube and some Netflix, my friend, because yeah. I, I don't know what to do. Right. Or maybe a couple of too many stiff, stiff drinks, you know, like, again, same thing. Maybe just kill the, yeah. kill the faculty of attention. Yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up, in a, in, I think, in a sort of naivety where it's just like, oh, people that do bad things are just bad. like they choose those bad things and that's a bad person. And, you know whatever, drugs, alcohol, and that stuff. I feel like the longer I live in this crazy world, there's part of me that goes, 
that's a horrible life destroying choice. But I kind of get it. I kind of get yeah. the move of like life is so nuts. And, and right, I haven't even experienced a lot of the horrible, horrible, horrible tragedy and abuse that a lot of people have in this world. So I can, I can like imagine that as like, oh, you've experienced just like the worst. And it seems like, yeah, killing that faculty of attention or numbing it out to the point where you can't attend to your pain anymore. Like that kind of makes sense, right? And I don't know, I, I think... I think in a healthy way, it's bred some compassion, right? And, and hopefully, listeners, that's what you hear as you talk about what's wrong with our attention is that what it means to be human in this crazy world is that we're just overwhelmed with demands on our attention and urgent voices crying out all the time for things to sell us, for things we need to take action on, right? It's just, oh, I can feel like my shoulders getting like tense right now, just like talking like, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. And that that's well, not that's, a judgment necessarily right. to start. It, you're not unique well, for feeling that way. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's a it's a freeing judgment. It's a placing the blame properly. Like yes. if you if you like us feel like your attention is fragmented and destructed and all over the place. Yep. That's because, as you said, we live in a world does, that has organized itself around trying to destroy us that way. <laughs> you know, we live in a fallen, broken world that is trying to pull us apart by pulling our attention apart. Yeah. I think this is where the pun kind of fits in, right? Mm -hmm. What needs to be fixed? Well, one, our attention is broken. We are weak and fragile. We are sinful in that sense that both unable to resist the world that's trying to pull us apart and desirous of being pulled apart. So we need to be fixed. The world needs to be fixed. Our faculty of attention does need fixing. But that's not really what we want to talk about. What we want to talk about is the pun, the other side, which is sort of what we think the answer is, which is how do we fix our attention on something? <laughs> Jesus, specifically. And, and his presence and what God says. And maybe that's the turning point. Um, Peter, as we do that turn, I know this is a hard question. We were bouncing this around beforehand. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you think, what are we talking about? What is attention? Yeah, yeah. What even is this thing we're talking about? This, yeah. Yeah, it feels it feels like an amorphous like I don't know, it's some faculty of what it is to be human to have a mind, you know, but it's this mixture, this amalgamation of our wills as well, our desires and our minds and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like and I think it boils down to choice. We have freedom to direct our attention. But it's just such a complex faculty that's influenced by so many factors that rarely does it feel as simple as hey, I would like to direct my attention here. And then our attention stays there, right? I like that word amalgamation. I know we were joking about it before the show being a big word, but I like that word because if you think of a human as having many different powers, abilities, we have the ability to see, for example, we have the ability to hear, um, we have the ability to choose, love, all these things that, you know, these traditional, we, under, we can parse out a human being according to their abilities. Attention maybe one way to think about it is the way that we direct all of those different powers. Vision is a great, yeah, simple example for the whole, you know, in your, in your field of vision, you have awareness. You can see a lot, actually. Most of it's fuzzy though. Like you have this field of vision and you're aware of everything in your field of vision. If something moves in the corner of your eye, you will then train your focal point, your focus, your attention on that thing, especially if that thing is vaguely threatening. So while we have this broader range of awareness, we, we really can only focus our attention in particular places. And that means it's inherently kind of a moral thing. We attend to what we think is important, to what we feel is important. So yes, if you see something in the corner of your eye move threateningly, you immediately attend to it because that's important. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and you stop attending to other things. You may still be aware of them in a general sense, but you can focus that attention on that stuff that's important. And so if you kind of keep that analogy in mind, look, I have this power of loving things. I have this power of um, thinking about things. I have this power of choosing things. And I can align those powers on one thing and focus on it. And that's going to be what's important to me. You can see why the world wants to distract us and destroy that, right? If we can fragment your attention and it's bouncing all over the place, then you can't see the lion coming. You can't see the danger. You're much more likely to be susceptible to the sin, the devil, the world. Anybody that doesn't have our best intention in mind is really trying hard to distract us all over the place, like a magician, right? Like, no offense to anybody who's a stage magician, but that's the art, right? They are practiced in the art of distracting your attention away from what's important so that what they're doing looks like magic. Yeah, the word there, misdirection, right? Yes. It's, it's misdirection. And I'm just thinking about that contrasted where like versus like what we aim to do as a ministry, like spiritual direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like they're opposed forces of the world's trying to misdirect us, get us looking at all the wrong things. While we're being like, how do we, how do we sustain our gaze on Jesus? Mm -hmm. That analogy of vision is so helpful, even though that's maybe not concrete about exactly what attention is. Like, I feel like that makes it clear in my experience. And so hopefully mm -hmm. for you listeners, that does too. But, and it connects so well with, with that phrase that we've been landing with recently about sustaining our gaze on Jesus, right? It's a, it's a vision thing. Where am I looking? Mm -hmm. So that, that really resonates with me. Yeah. And if you keep kind of with those analogies, it's like, as you said, the world is chaotic and full of suffering and without direction, without clarity of attention directed towards the right things, the chaos, the suffering feels overwhelming. And I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm paralyzed. And does that not the way we all feel just absolutely paralyzed? And so, you know, I love that image of as long as we're kind of looking on this horizontal level at all the stuff everywhere in the carnival and in the world, I can't, I don't even, I can't even begin to make good choices or to know where to go or how to feel. But if I lift my gaze and see, you know, I'm thinking of myself as a little boy. This is so relevant right now. Mm -hmm. I remember this one. If I lift my gaze to, my, to see my mom or dad, then I have direction. And I remember distinctly this time in, in a county fair carnival-like place, I got lost because I was looking at all the trinkets and I was all distracted by all the little vendors and everything. And then, then I got kind of panicked. And the first thing I did was like, grabbed the hand of the jeans next to me because that was my dad's jeans. And it was not my dad. Mm -hmm. It was not. It terrified the heck out of me. And the guy was nice, but terrified me because I didn't know where my dad was because I was trying to lift my gaze. I was trying to find direction again. And this was not it. Um, you know, good news is my dad was not very far away. I found him. It was fine. Little Brandon mm -hmm. was safe. Everything was mm -hmm. good. But but that's like exactly it, right? Here I am in this crazy, chaotic, destructive world. Fixing our attention doesn't mean fixing our problem of brokenness, but it means lifting our gaze to Jesus, fixing our eyes on him, right? Is that, I mean, what do you, how do you react to that? Yeah, that, that makes sense. It, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. We, when we have a reference point, we're no longer lost in the sea of something. We go, okay, there's my trusted true north. And I can, I can head in that direction, at least in this moment, as I have eyes on the target. And that gives a lot of comfort, I think. It know. also changes the way, like, I think one of the things, okay, what we could get off on the a tangent here that would go the wrong direction, I think, which is to make this conversation what it usually is about which is our choosing our endpoint and our goal. But I think the way you framed this is less about 
us choosing our, our direction and goal and what we're going to do next, but it's lifting our gaze to see the bigger reality and the context in which everything really is, right? Peter, what just jumped in my mind was Philippians 4, you know, or, or even the Psalms 121 we talked about. Yeah. What's wrong with our attention is it's fragmented and everywhere else, all over the place. But that's not reality. Philippians 4, the, the turn, turning point is the Lord is near. Reality is God is present. Dad is present. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like thinking you were lost and then your dad's like, got, you know, it, it is holding your hand and you're like, oh, 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 thank goodness, you know. As I've been processing and thinking about this topic, I really feel like the war for our attention boils down to our core need for security and significance in this crazy chaotic world where it, we feel lost, we feel maybe threatened, or at least if we're not threatened, then it's just like, I just don't know what to do, right? I don't have any direction yeah. or significance because there's just there's a myriad of options. It's just, just overwhelming and paralyzing, right? And so you don't have any that security or significance. It's just, you're lost. Which is super threatening. Yes, yeah, that experience. When you're, right. when you're, yeah, when you're lost in a sea of options or when you're lost in, and, and let's be clear, we are threatened. The world is trying to literally kill us. <laughs> so like, and it is terrifying. Yeah. And yes. I have no idea how to out, no way out. Right. So it's like, what could possibly like change that equation mm -hmm. to allow us the opportunity for something other than responding in fear to the, the actual threats of the world? It's like being lost in the woods on a dark night. Everything feels threatening. I have no idea what I should fix my attention on because literally every move is scary. Every sound, every feel, that could be the thing that's going to kill me. I am paralyzed because I can't fix my attention on anything because it's all threatening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The phrase that grounds this truth for me that I want to arrive at, that I think is the turning point, the phrase that works for me is Jesus is for me, right? And I yes. think you, I, I love the way, was it? Piotr Mawish, that, um, who, who said that God is for you with the entirety of his being, that, that yeah. has also captured me too. But it's this idea that um, amidst the chaos of this world, there is the, like this, the idea that the author, the, the almighty God, who, who can even be in control over all the chaos, is my ally. Like that's the thought that gives me like backbone or, or resolve or co comfort. It's like, okay, there's someone bigger than all this craziness. And, mm -hmm. and that's not an amorphous being who just mm -hmm. says, whatever, yin and yang, it's all gonna just flow. You mm -hmm. just gotta ride. He, he says, no, I'm for you. Like I care about you. And I care that you're being harassed and threatened mm -hmm. by all this craziness. And and guess what? I am near, right? That's what the Philippians 4, I think 4.4 4 says, right? The Lord is near. And I think that that, acknowledging that truth, recognizing it, noticing it, allows me to back off of that fight or flight response that I get in when I'm just threatened by the world to like say, okay, I don't, I don't need to run or hide or whatever, or fight or, or be defensive. I've got an ally. I've got my dad, my heavenly father's right here with me mm -hmm. and, and I'm okay. I think maybe for listeners, it's helpful to say the reason we keep going back to, this is a true back porch conversation where we are just batting an idea around. We're kind of bouncing all over, but the Philippians thing has been central to our understanding of what we're doing as Signpost in Ministries, helping you lift your gaze. But this imagery is working for me, Peter, what you're talking about right now. So here's the context. If the world we live in is that dark forest where it's everything is threatening, that's the context, I think, of Philippians 4. Things are nuts. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. 
let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Here's what we understand uh, Paul to be doing. He's shifting your gaze from, oh my gosh, everything's threatening all around me, to look up. God is right here with you. You're not alone mm-hmm. in the woods. It's not, you're not, you're not lost and alone in a dark woods, depending on yourself to secure you and figure out what to do next. No, the Lord is here. And so to lift your gaze doesn't mean to like make a moral choice to think about better things. It just means to pay attention to to turn your attention to the reality you're already in, which is God is right there on the path with you, holding your hand. I mean, that's the Psalms all over the place, right? You hold my right hand. Mm -hmm. That that many Psalms talk about that in the midst of the chaos, that God is at my right hand. Yeah. And that the, the move is not, you need to somehow get yourself in order and make better choices and prioritize your life. The move is notice, just notice that the reality you're in is different than you thought it was in. Like you were saying, I'm not actually lost in that carnival. My dad is holding onto my right hand. I thought I was lost, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and we were talking about this beforehand, but you you mentioned a little bit ago the moral component of our attention right it's sort of a direction of our our will and loves and so what we pay attention to matters we've said it this way like you see more of what you attend to so if you're attending to more evil filth in the world right that's that is bad but what is also important and and not I think it's it's almost a prerequisite to recognizing the presence of God as good as him as an ally on our side is sort of dealing with like, wait, but I've been attending to the wrong things and kind of feeling like God wouldn't be that ally. But, and we were talking about this before. The good news is that God sees our situation as harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd as, as you know, the gospel of John puts it, I think. but. Um, mm-hmm. And and he says, I know you can't. I know you can't even lift your gaze. I know mm-hmm. in many ways you want to, to look at all the wrong things. He's right there alongside us the whole way, but and he also whispers to us that it's not so much about learning to retrain our attention as it is the fact that Jesus did it perfectly. He says, I've already attended to all the right things for you. He He is that great high priest who has accomplished everything for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the image is very much, as you're talking about that, I'm getting that image throughout scripture. We want to read it as the world is chaotic. We need to fix it. Mm. My attention is fragmented. I need to do the work to fix it. I'm threatened. Nothing can save me except for me. And God's story throughout scripture is constantly, I'm right here. And we're like, you might be right here, but you're one of those other distractions because you're probably mad at us. And God's story is, I'm right here and I'm for you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like the story is never bring me down. Focus your attention on me so that I will. It's the, the, he's always just sort of calling our attention back to the reality that he is right here, has never left, and is for us. Mm-hmm. And then we get, get to that point of Jesus, who God becoming human, recognizing our frailty, knows that merely the call alone does not fix our attention. We are so frail and weak and broken that him just saying, I'm right here and I'm for you isn't enough because we're not even good and strong enough really to keep our attention sustained on that. So Jesus does that for us too. 
Yeah. He's like, all right, I will take on all of humanity and I will do the work of sustaining my attention on the father full time. Right. That's what he says, John 15, 19. Basically, I only do what I see the father doing. I always keep my attention firmly fixed on the father. And in Christ, all of humanity now is accounted as having fully fixed their attention on God the Father with no other distractions. And I'm even released from that burden. You know, he's, he's like, yeah. now pay attention to the fact that not only am I always been here for you, not only the fact that I am for you and everything, I'll even do the work of attending to that fact for you. Mm -hmm. but yeah. That's that like that kind of hurts my head, but in like a good way, as I, Peter, endeavor to focus my attention on things that are good, true, and beautiful, right? All the things that Paul lists in Philippians 4 mm -hmm. 8. It's no longer a, and if I don't, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, this condemnation or, or shame, it's like, and if I don't, Jesus has got me. And, and, and I don't know, I think it's paradoxical that the very truth that Jesus has already done it all for me is the thing that I end up wanting to attend to or, or just am drawn to, right? That's yeah. like in realizing that I don't have to attend, I don't have to have perfect attention and, and direct my attention at all times towards the true good and beautiful, like that is the good and beautiful truth that I'm drawn to because I'm like, wow, that is so wonderful. I'm so glad I don't mm -hmm. have to do that. An incredible like sense of relief washes over me. Mm -hmm. And I find myself attending to that truth because <laughs> yeah. it's, yeah. it's good news because I'm like, it's, I'm experiencing it as this is wonderful, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. almost without trying, it's like I end up in that place that I wanted to be. Not to almost. Be no, not almost literally. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, and this is a, this is a longstanding principle that I have, I learned from seminary and I've taught to many people. If you want people to think about Jesus, trust Jesus, don't tell them to think about Jesus and to trust Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. If you want any human being to think about anything, don't tell them to think about it. Tell them about it. It's like really obvious once you notice it, right? If I tell you, you need to think about fill in the blank. Well, you're already thinking about what you're thinking about, not thinking about the thing. You're distracted immediately. You know, Peter, you really need to be thinking about your wife. You should be thinking more about her more often. If you're like me, the very next thing you think is, oh, I'm crap. I don't think about her enough. I put myself before her and you're not thinking about her. <laughs> hey, Peter, Rachel's really awesome. She's a great person and you are lucky to have her. I, I really like her. And you, she makes you a better person because she's smart and she's kind. Now, who are you thinking about? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't tell you to think about anything. So it's like, yeah. it's so obvious. And yeah. this is what Jesus does to us all the time. He doesn't say, think about these things. Yes, Paul is saying that. But what he just do do got done saying is, the Lord is near. Right, right. And I think that's the principle here is that our attention is fixed on Jesus because he calls to it. Just by being present. Yeah. Just by showing us himself. You know, the image, I, and, and I'll stop. The metaphor I had mm -hmm. in my head was, um, keeps coming back to that little kid. We are like little children, right? The scriptures talk about this. We do not have the ability to control our attention. Little children don't have that ability. They're distracted by many things. And when you'd have me as a little child, I'm thinking of my own little children now in Pike's Place Market in Seattle. So busy, so many people. Totally distracted. Left alone would get run over because they'd run out into the street. But they're not alone. I, as their father who loves them dearly, 
literally grabbed their hands and directed them through the crowd, attending to the things that needed to be attended to for them on their Mm -hmm. behalf. In so doing, one, they experienced the goodness of their father. Two, they attended to it. And three, they learned what to attend to. Because I did it for them. I didn't, ex- I didn't tell them, now pay attention to the traffic. I mean, I do when they're older, but not, you know, not when they're little children. I just take their hand and walk across and look for the cars and walk across with them. That's the image. Jesus is doing it for us. And we're just kind of like, huh. He's here. I'm safe. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a wonderful image. Jesus is the type of person who does the good for us on our behalf. Not requiring thanks, praise, adoration. He, he just because he loves us and says, if you're left on your own, you're going to get hurt. And I, I love you. So he grabs our hand. And that's a beautiful image. And it's like, to me, I think about what what a gift to get to the point like where, where I do go. Oh wow, look what he's been doing for me all this time. Like I don't know. The being able to articulate that feels like a gift to me, at least of like mm-hmm. the noticing his love. There are two images at work here. One is of, of us as the little child who can't do it. It's what Paul says. First, he talks about Jesus. God is near. He doesn't tell us what to fix our attention on. Then he does say, okay, now think on these, attend to these things. So there is a recognition that we can practice it. Mm -hmm. And I think keeping these two images separate and intention is going to help us, one, recognize We are always the little child who can't do it. And two, there is an invitation to do it. And if you ever get stuck on the, if you ever get stuck on the invitation to do it as law and I'm like, oh crap, I don't do it very well. Just go back to the other image and stay there. (laughs) You know, don't like, don't try to resolve the paradox, live in it. But what are ways practically that you have found gracefully that you have found Mm -hmm to allow your attention to cease resisting looking up. Yeah. I feel like there's sort of a chain reaction that happens for me. And and we've kind of talked about it here, but I feel like at first, for me, the very, the first thing like has been sort of just a general self-awareness to revisit this image again. A young child can't articulate why they're terrified at the carnival overwhelmed and everything they, they just know that they're going whoa 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 right like they couldn't articulate wow i'm really distracted and he keeps talking really loud and that guy's got a clown suit on and waving it. you know they can't even say it they're just experiencing it right and like i felt that way and i felt that god's invitation that for my personal growth and for fruitful you know trusting him has been to practice like articulating some of these things which is a reason why i've got a you know, these notebooks that I've used over the past, you know, two years, because I've just, I've stuck them in my pocket and said, God, I want to become more aware. I think you're inviting me to become more aware of what's going on inside of the, of the, the voices, internal and external that have got my attention. And so without judgment, I've just been trying to write down thoughts and feelings ago. Uh, this intrusive thought is coming in or, the, mm-hmm. you know, this, this good thought, well, that seems really interesting. I, I'm thinking about that right now. And just for me, that's been like the baby step in of like, at least noticing that, noticing what I'm noticing, right? Mm-hmm. And and so that's like sort of the first like step of like, okay, I, I, I am noticing things. And then, I don't know, for me, a lot, a lot of times what ends up happening with when I write is I, I it doesn't start out as a prayer, but <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just writing different things. And then somewhere along the way, as I'm taking note, of things and either if it's something really good that i'm like that was really cool or if it's something really hard or challenging or chaotic where i'm like i'm just feeling overwhelmed some point it transitions to either at god help or god thank you or what do i do about this Mm -hmm. and that's like i feel like that's the stage for me 
where like the the gaze is like just to my surroundings and then to like the hand that's holding my hand and being like god god what do i do about this or god look at that that's awesome that's so cool and and i don't know the way i've thought of it is like almost bringing my stream of consciousness into god's presence right and 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 understanding that he's okay with that that he he maybe even enjoys that he enjoys me being telling him all the things that I'm thinking or feeling and that he's like, Oh yeah. Uh Uh-huh. That tell me more, you know, like he's interested in that and that there's like that safety to do that. Um, yeah. In many ways, it reminds me a lot of the practice of centering prayer, which is, I don't know, maybe that connects in here for, for a very practical way of, of, yeah sustaining my attention on jesus but it's that image of sitting on the bank of the of the river where my thoughts are the boats going down and sitting on the bank with jesus and and just letting it happen noting them you know and i don't know to me that's i I, I haven't laid these out as steps but this is my, my experience of it as writing somehow that all comes forward no i think that's beautifully said actually by attending to where your attention is going you've already made the first upward look because you have stepped out of the, you've reframed yourself for yourself. You are no longer in the stream of, you are no longer identified with a stream of consciousness. You are having a stream of conscious thoughts. Mm -hmm. You are having a series of noticings and attentions. And right there immediately, just in that move alone, you have stepped out of the immediate carnival flow into the presence of God who sees you from a bigger perspective. And you are, you know, you could, you, you are invited to, as you say, notice yourself with Jesus noticing you. And the moment you do that, you're already at a place of seeing a bigger context. Yeah. You know, at least the possibility of seeing it as being with God and God present. Because God is not caught up in your stream of consciousness. God is not swirling around and confused. He's watching it. But even more in what you said, which is even better, it's at least the possibility he might actually enjoy you. He might be watching your crazy, Mm -hmm. complex stream of consciousness and going, man, this guy is great. Look at this thing I made. I love him. And you're allowed to step out with him and say, wow, look at me thinking all these things. Yeah. There's this idea of the trap of mindfulness, right? Mindfulness is, I think, by and large, a, a pretty healthy, popularized like term about yeah. people learning that they're not just, uh, like you said, to to It's attending them, to their attention. Right. To yeah. separate themselves from, I am not my thoughts, I have thoughts. And I think that's good, right? That's an accurate yeah. representation of how God created us. But the trap can be, I'm noticing what I'm noticing, and I'm noticing that I'm noticing what I'm noticing. And I notice, and you just go in this yeah. circle. And it doesn't, I don't know if, like, eventually if that gets anywhere productive, Of it's like this, almost this trap, this, I, like, I have to be fastidiously Mm-hmm. attentive mm-hmm. or else I might miss something and, and it's like this it's, it becomes a law of its own I have to notice why I'm noticing that I'm noticing mm-hmm. noticing noticing mm-hmm. right and what breaks that and what you just said is that somewhere along the journey of of that for 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 me has been I'm noticing that I'm noticing things and I'm noticing that God is notice like God is yeah. here. like and the cycle stops with him like yeah. it, I don't keep this inward introspective downward Sp- uh, spiral this trap of continual self introspection because God's there, and then it can become right. a dialogue, or, or there's this yeah. other person that enters that puts a stop to that downward spiral. Right. Yeah, the most basic skill of just being becoming aware that I have awareness. Maybe that's maybe that's the like broadest sense of whatever mindfulness means. But from there, it can go two different directions. It can go inward to look for something inside to try to accomplish some sort of goal by practicing this skill. Or it can go outward and be like, oh, 
God is, God is present outside here with me. And there's no need, there's no pressures, there's no, I don't need to accomplish anything here. I don't need to search for God, but like invitation is to step out of the stream into God's presence. Mm -hmm. And and you're right. It's, it stops. It's like my context has changed. I'm not in that dark forest anymore. There's parts of it that feel like that, but I'm actually in a bigger context with God. As a side note, this is, this is occurring to me now, nearly separate topics, but this is exactly like the heart of what the book interior freedom by Jacques Philippe is about the Uh space of interior freedom that he's talking about is this ever present, ever available space with God, no matter the external circumstances where we can find ourselves secure, safe, and step Uh out of whatever is happening to us, whatever suffering it it is not us. There exists this internal, eternal core being that, that resides with God. Yeah. And, and that safety that can look at our lives and, and trustingly consent to that is like, okay, yep. I am not the things happening to me. I am not my thoughts. I am not all this chaos. Mm-hmm. I am a beloved child of God. Do you think, do you think that the word internal there is, is unhelpful in some contexts because it's confused with like new age and other things? But what he's talking about is not like going inward into myself to find God. What he's talking about is a quiet, private space. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a space that I can touch and be in without having to change any external circumstances. So it's interior in that sense, but it's yeah. not interior that it's inside me because it's not inside of me. It's actually inside God. Yeah. You know, it's finding yes. myself inside a bigger reality who is Jesus. I'm not finding God in me. I'm finding me in God. So it's interior because you can't stop me from doing it by doing anything on outside of me. Yeah. But it's not interior like it exists inside me. It exists oh, because yeah. I exist inside God. Yeah. The the phrase a hiding place is coming to mind. And I think this yeah. is in a psalm like it. Yeah. Like he is the shelter of his wing. It's that place that yeah. we can always go to no matter whatever circumstance we're actually yeah yeah Yeah. and i think okay so to sort of wrap this up then because i think Mm -hmm. this is a good place Mm -hmm. to wrap up that's the invitation or that's the place where god is like what can we do if if that's even the right question to enter that space to fix our attention on Jesus, to lift our gaze from the chaos. And I, for one, would very practically simply reference, perhaps read a particular psalm or two that does not talk about doing this, but that is doing this. One of the psalms we came up with at the beginning, um, Psalm 121, which talks about doing this, uh, but I think does it as well. It's, here's what Psalm 121 says. Notice, I think it starts by telling you to lift your gaze, but then it tells you what it, it's like. It gives you the thing to gaze at. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and your going both now and forever. So here's the practical way. Sure. Like you write down in your journals, first, lift your eyes from all the stuff and look literally, I mean, physically, literally look up at some mountains or some trees or something, just in the physical movement. Attend to what you're attending to. Where will my help come from? Where am I looking? What am I asking for help? Who am I asking for help? Money? The internet? Distract? Well, who am I? Okay, no, I want to attend to the Lord. 
and then do what Philippians says. Well, who is this Lord? Stop now thinking about your attention and just start thinking about what he's like. What has he done? He's the maker of heaven and earth. He has protected the peoples whose feet have slipped. He doesn't sleep. And, And literally, I think that's when Paul is saying, fill your mind with these things. He's talking about filling your mind with filling your heart with the things that God has done and what he's like. I will add one last thing, which is, in my experience, it is not enough to simply think or say the words. One must also feel the words. All the way back to the beginning, Our attention is that stack of faculties from our conscious thoughts down through our physical orientation. So I have found that on my long walks, when I am terrified and distracted, just saying, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, just those words doesn't do a whole lot to fix my attention on Jesus. But when I say the words, and soften my physical being and open what I call soul, my will, drop my resistance and accept that as true and as as a experienced embodied feeling, then things change because all of my faculties are now attending to the reality that God is the maker of heaven and earth and he will not sleep and he will protect me. And that's just saying the words doesn't do much, but going with my body and heart, Yes, Lord, this is true. That's the consent. Yeah. That's the directing of all of my faculties to this truth. Yeah. That makes a big difference for me. Yeah. Uh, just the turn of phrase, right? Piotr said, God is for you with the entirety of his being, right? All uh-huh. his faculties, all everything, God's will, his compassion, his gut, his, every, everything is trained on you, his child. And that almost invites the reciprocal response of like that. I want to, I want to turn to you with my, my, my body, my mind, my spirit, whatever, however you parse those out, the soul, right? And it's this beautiful, I don't know, God does it first, right? It's just a response yeah. to his, his attention yeah. to me, right? Yeah. His, and, and the, I don't know, I just, that's beautiful. Um, God's not just attention. thinking about you. God's right? feeling about you. Yeah. So we can do the same. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, Peter, I feel like this was a really fun and interesting conversation. Listeners, we hope you enjoyed it as well. Peter is working on, I'm going to put it out there. He's kind of yeah, bat- yeah. batting around the idea of putting this into some thoughts and maybe even a published little yeah. journal of sorts. We kind of had this idea that it'd be fun to create a series of little things field note sized journals with content and places to journal. And this might be one of the first ones we make if we can afford it and fund it. We'd love to hear your thoughts. If you want to send us an email, you can send it to podcast at signpostin.org. Thoughts on this episode, thoughts on what kind of resource might be useful to you. Um, Do you like the idea of creating a little series of field note sized sized journals that both have content and places for you to journal in as well. We'd just love to hear from you. We'd also desperately need you, are begging you, please, on my knees, I'm begging you to tell people about our episodes, our podcast, our ministry. One of the things we came away from our staff retreat realizing is that we're we're not going to try to convince people that they need what Signpost In has to offer because that's not going to work and is kind of coercive and we don't want to do that. And ick, what we want to do is find the people who need us and then meet them where they are. They're not on social media because the people who want what we have to offer are skeptical, just like we are, that social media is even good for them. They're not excited about slick advertising campaigns because those are just programs trying to manipulate you. Where they are, are in your circle of friends listening to you because they trust you. So if you know somebody who could benefit from 
our resources, our podcast, our book, our weekly email. If you know somebody who could really use a friend to talk to in spiritual direction, if you know somebody who um, needs to connect and get time away at a retreat, think a specific person. I don't need you to think of 50 people. I need you to think of two people. Then will you please talk to them face to face? Like literally go say, look, I know this ministry. You need to go check it out. Go to signpostin.org. Here's what you need to do. You don't need to know our words for this. Tell them in your words why what we're doing has been helpful. That's what's going to help them. We really want to reach out more and we need your help to do it. You're the one that can do it for us. So please do so. And we would greatly appreciate it. But more importantly, I think the people who you will reach out to will appreciate it because they need the help to lift their gaze from the chaos, to sustain it on Jesus, to have more friends walking with them in this chaotic world. Thank you very much for listening. May the grace of Christ go with you wherever the road takes you. Amen. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Signpost End Ministries, a nonprofit Christian ministry dedicated to strengthening people's relationship with Jesus and walking with them compassionately on their life's journey. We offer spiritual direction, retreats, and lots of other resources like this podcast. Please visit us at signpostin.org to learn more. We especially want to thank our generous donors who support our work and keep this podcast going. If you've benefited from something you've heard, please consider supporting us by making a tax-deductible gift at signpostin.org slash donate. We also want to thank Rex Daughtry for creating the original theme music for this podcast. You can check out more of his work at his website, and you can find all the links in our show notes.